I wanted to, I'm going to speak from the text, which will appear on the, on the board. Uh, it's not my normal way of speaking, so you'll have to forgive me. But uh, also, I just want to say that we have heard an awful lot about science and its relationship to spirituality or to truth. So I'm not going to speak today specifically about science and its relationship. More I think I'm going to talk about the way that we actually do come to a deeper understanding and unfoldment of our own consciousness. And so that is why I'll be speaking about the mind which is illumined, the illuminated mind. So. Uh, the premise that I'll begin from is the idea that we have, in fact, descended. We have become involved in matter. Um, and now we find ourselves at a point where something in this involutionary process is changing. I'm going to try to focus on where we find ourselves now and then begin from that point of this arc of involution and evolution. So what does that mean and how do we respond to this particular place where we find ourselves now? A uh, part of my title relates to illumination and illumination is something that very often we regard as a specific moment you know, where the light bulb comes on above our heads and we suddenly know and I think that is of course a correct way of looking at it, but it is also that moment is the result of a specific process that we undergo. And uh, so often in theosophical terms, we think of human transformation as that sudden moment as well. So we'll speak about the process. So where do we find ourselves now? What is our actual situation in this particular point of the cycle? So what I find is, as a young person, it's probably the experience of many of us. I would sit down and my fathers or my uncles or different people would tell me their stories. And it's just the way these things work that after a certain number of years, you've heard that story many times before. And yet I would sit and listen to them speak as if it was fresh as if I was hearing it for the first time. And for my elders, when they would tell the story, actually they would tell it with such a joy that it was fresh and being told for the first time. What I find with myself as my relationship to this sort of thinking involved in theosophy has evolved, more and more I find myself becoming more like my parents and uncles in the sense that there are certain stories, there are certain ways of thinking that have become primary to me. And I find myself coming back to those things again and again. So in many ways, I think I'm becoming my father at this point, which is a, which is a good thing in my case. Um, So in my theosophical thinking, I find myself arriving at this point. Uh, there are, in fact, for me, certain essential points that I would like to stress during today's talk, uh, that until we actually reach the point where we can see these things and understand them more deeply, then really everything else that we plug into our thinking is really just in a category of more information. It may be theosophical information, it may be mind-expanding information, but information can only lead us so far. And so there's something more that I think has to be added to our process of considering these essential sorts of issues. So for us as human beings, there is an essential problem, which if we could resolve it, 
then all other things would fall into place. There is one particular place it seems that we lose ourselves. And it begins with something that HPB had talked about in her three fundamental propositions. And that idea that she spoke about was that we are, each of us, involved in an obligatory pilgrimage. The pilgrim soul finds itself in this process of incarnation and finds ourselves at a point where we're trying to figure out the way to move beyond this very repetitive cycle that we find ourselves involved in life after life after life. Uh, it seems as if very much of what we do during the course of these lives is to try to figure out ways to make it more enjoyable, to improve the flying moments. But ultimately, there comes a point for each one of us where we have to think a little bit more deeply than that. So what is it that we can, in fact, do to interrupt this repetitive cycle of births, rebirths, continual exposure to varieties of suffering, continual thinking in terms of how to develop new ways to suffer that we engage in life after life. So just to describe how I see the process, the process begins for us when the soul first comes into a body, when we become incarnate. Um, there's a story from the Egyptian tradition that talks about a coffin that Seth built for Osiris and had to trick Osiris into getting into this coffin. Uh, the coffin had been designed so it would specifically fit only Seth's body. And in, in, the, in the legend, uh, he was tricked into going in there when uh, Seth asked the crowd who could fit into this coffin. It's so beautifully made. It had jewels all over it. Nobody could fit it. Osiris went into it, and then they closed it shut and sealed it. The story has multiple meanings, as all of these stories do. But I think for our consideration, it's, it depicts the idea of what has happened to each and every one of us. In this life, we have incarnated into a body. We have taken on a form. And in that process, just like Osiris who was sealed into the coffin, we have been sealed in in ways that have denied us access to some deeper resources, something that we might describe as the divine or our spiritual center, or simply an expanded consciousness. Can I ask, I'm, I have a particular text, and I could read it, but is it possible, is it being followed well enough from here? Okay. It's more comfortable for me, is all. <laughs> that and a breeze, and I can do anything. So, the problem for us as spiritual beings working, attempting to work through a material body is a problem of false identity. Uh, in the process of birth, we take on not just one identity, but we take on multiple false identities. So just to walk through the process. When we think in terms of the soul, that undying portion of the uh, human being that incarnates life after life, whether it's your soul, my soul, it's something that is completely free of the attributes that we find becoming assigned to it with each birth. A soul has no gender. It has no political party. It has no nationality. 
Although if souls could choose, I'm sure they would choose to be either French or Italian, uh, not American. <laughs> but that's not the quality or the nature of the soul. So what happens at birth is this process, it's where this process begins. Because at the moment of birth, each and every one of us, whether you're born in a hospital or whether you're born at home, upon your arrival in the world, the very first thing that is declared is a gender. You become male, you become female. And everybody who meets you from that point on points to this body and says, it's a boy, it's a girl, and treats you accordingly. So what that means is that at that very moment, our behavior becomes shaped through the environment, which is this world that we find ourselves in. In America, if you're born as a boy, playing with dolls is not an option. It's thought of as something that's aberrant. It's not proper behavior. What is proper is to give this little boy a gun and play games where you're shooting something. War games. And that's the proper acculturation for someone who is born as a, in a, into a male body in America. Every culture has different versions of this exact same thing. So along with that, you get a family, you get a family name, you get a religion, you get a nationality, on and on and on. At a certain point, we find ourselves not only being called by others as a Christian or as an American, but at a certain point the process changes, and it's a very important change that occurs, because there comes a point where we actually start to speak of ourselves as male. I am a male. I am named Tim. I am an American, a Christian, a Buddhist, whatever. And it's a significant change in our approach to this new reality we have found ourselves born into. We accept these identities, which largely have been imposed until that time. So if it stopped at that, that would not be such a terrible thing, but it doesn't. Because we reach a point where not only do we want to be not only do we say we are something, but now we want to be a good American. I want to be a good theosophist. I want to be a famous theosophist. I want to be international president of the Theosophical <laughs> Society. No. It doesn't end. And it doesn't end in any of our categories. So this self that is initially imposed, then accepted, then seeks to expand itself. And it's a process that goes on in every single one of us around the world. And you can imagine seven billion people behaving in this manner. You reach the point where there is no question why you see wars, why you see the political strife, why you see the sort of parasitical uh, financial sorts of arrangements that are in the world. Because every single person who does not have some deeper awareness of a purpose in life is engaged in this process of the ever-expanding I. So, Incarnation has its consequences. The first consequence is that we take on, then we accept a variety of identities. 
Of course, the good part about it is that this ever-expanding eye has certain limitations. There is something inherent in this process that is experienced by us as something that is not good, but is probably the very best thing about it. That one of the natural occurrences, and it's inevitable, that with incarnation comes identification, and with this expanding sense of I, there will necessarily come a point when we reach a place within us where we are dissatisfied. It's unavoidable. There is not enough money to satisfy us. There is not enough love to satisfy us. There are not enough accolades or positions. There's always something more. And thus comes a certain dissatisfaction, which once we consider it, we start to find that it applies to everything about this system that has been described as samsara, this wheel of repetitive illusion. And while it's a very uncomfortable thing, personally, it's the best thing that could ever happen to us. Because it's only at that point that we start to look for solutions. It's only at that point that something like theosophy, that something like meditation, that something like an inner spiritual quest for a deeper unfoldment becomes meaningful. And that's the point at which every one of us find ourselves now. A wonderful point. <clears throat> so having realized that the particular path we have been following is not going to lead us where we want to go, something else begins, and that is something that could be described as a search. We become seekers for happiness, for truth, for something that we can call by a variety of names. In the initial stages of this search, what we are really seeking is something to fill our sense of emptiness, something that will halt this growing sense of dissatisfaction. And so we search in a number of ways. Many people who are in this room, many of us who are in these seats, have come through a variety of different paths to get here. I mean, any one of us in our conversations, you'll talk people who have found that maybe the Catholic religion did it for them, and then maybe that wasn't quite enough. So maybe Sufism, not enough. Maybe particular forms of meditation, not enough. We try many things. But ultimately, at its initial stages, it's something where I think what most people want is we're looking for some sense of freedom. And in our developing stages, what we're looking to be free, the freedom is a freedom from something else, is what, how this search begins. We're looking to be free from those things that we feel limit us, free from unkind people, free from bad situations, free from not having enough money, free from a whole lot of things. So this is the initial stage in our thinking about freedom. But because it's part of a process, that's something that also changes uh, and it unfolds. And so at a certain point in our growth, what began as a freedom from limitations becomes a higher sense, something a little bit more developed. And then we start to become focused on not just freedom from limitations, but we start to become aware that in fact, the frame of mind or the habit of our being that actually is productive of a sense of happiness and connection with others is not this limiting freedom from, but a freedom to. A freedom to be kind. A freedom to love. 
a freedom to be honest and open. These sorts of freedoms are of a higher nature. And they're the sorts of freedoms that actually, as we find ourselves in these frames of mind, those are the times when we actually experience an unfoldment of something deeper within us. And so we find ourselves coming back to try to repeat it. So, we realize that there is a way of behaving, of turning our minds that seems to lead toward the experience that we have described as happiness. And of course, one of the fundamental ideas of Buddhism is that every single thing that lives is searching for happiness. There is nothing that breathes, nothing that is sentient, that is not trying to create the situation that brings happiness to itself. And that goes for you, and that goes for me. Everybody is involved in this activity. Two thousand eleven, uh, when the Dalai Lama visited with us in Chicago, it was a very wonderful occasion for everyone involved, especially so for me, because I had two days in which I could hang out with His Holiness. <laughs> you know, we could uh, do lunch together. You know. <laughs> So it was a very good time, but it was one of those times where I had an opportunity to actually sit you know, around in very normal sorts of situations with someone who has this sort of iconic presence worldwide. And so we would sit and we would have lunch, and I was, to tell the truth, I was watching to see how he ate his food. <laughs> I mean, I have to be honest, the man is, said to be an incarnation of Avalokiteshvara. I'm an incarnation of Tim, and here I'm with this. <laughs> so, you know, what do you do with that? So I was watching, just, he likes noodles, I can tell you this is a secret, don't tell anyone. So he likes noodles, and he was eating his noodles, and I was waiting to see if perhaps they jumped off the fork <laughs> and came to his mouth, but no. He eats noodles like you eat noodles. But one of the things that did happen, you know, I had an opportunity to talk with him about some different subjects. But one of the things that he said was something very simple. But I think like many of the most profound things that we encounter in life, it's found in the very simple things. In talking about his lifetime of spiritual practice, which he was found at a very early age, so from the time he was like 10 years old onward, he was trained by the very best, highest meditators, highest uh, students in Tibetan Buddhism. And so he has been a practitioner all of his life. And what he said that was so meaningful to me was that one of the results of his practice over all of this long time has been that now he finds that most of the time, most of the time, he's happy. Not 24-7, not that he's engaged in celestial realms of happiness full time, but that most of the time, he's happy. What was so profound to me was that that's a doable goal. You know, many of us set our sights on the very highest, and I think we should. But at the same time, the experience that seems to foster these deeper states of consciousness is one that's right here with us full time, which is the idea of what, in fact, brings about that particular balance that we end up describing as happiness. So, to me, that was rather remarkable. After so many years uh, involved in theosophical study and practice and thought, it comes time for us to try to live it and synthesize it into certain essentials. So, one of the essentials in, is this approach we have taken to happiness, 
We recognize that it is our state of mind and our behaviors that bring it about. One of the things theosophy gives us is a wonderful road map, a map of the landscape of the inner human terrain, which is a valuable thing. So, again, a simple expression, probably one of the few simple things that HPB said is in responding to the question of what is it, what is a human being? That's a question that has a variety of levels on which it could be answered. But one of the things I have always taken heart from and that has uh, had great meaning for me is one of the things that she said about what is a human being, because she described it very simply. In her terminology, uh, Blavatsky's terminology, a human being is highest spirit and lowest matter linked by mind. Highest spirit, lowest matter, and then the link is the mind. Someone the other day was talking to us about the Antakarana. So the linkages that take place between the passing personality and the spiritual, the purusha and the prakriti. And I think for me it's something that's quite important because it defines for us quite clearly where it is that we need to look to do the work that we're going to do during this lifetime. And it is in fact in this linking ground of the mind. So it's important for us to not merely understand technically what this mind is, but to understand it practically. What is the mind? So I often find myself the beginning by describing what it's not. And I think for our purposes, the contemporary uh, scientific the prevailing contemporary scientific view of mind is a point of view that would be best discarded. In the sense that the prevailing view of mind is that it's something that incorporates sensations, emotions, even intuitions into some sort of cognitive process, but it's a process that is linked and generated by the physical organ, which is the brain. The other day I was talking about reductionist materialism. So the prevailing idea that cannot be supported in any sort of way is that somehow these molecules that comprise the gray matter of the brain generate consciousness uh, in some way that has no no possible scientific explanation and that doesn't even make common sense. So that's the explanation that's best tossed away. The example that I tend to use is in, if we think about it, in the year 2014, probably everybody here is exposed to what a television set is. And there is nobody here anymore who believes that the programs that come onto this physical machine are actually being created by the television? Or should I, I, maybe I'm being presumptuous. Does anybody believe that the television <laughs> creates the programs? If so, talk to me afterwards. <laughs> but nobody believes that. The physical television set is a receiving instrument for programs that are created around the world and which when it's properly tuned, it's capable of receiving those specific programs. Look at the brain that way. The brain is a receiving organism for consciousness of a particular spectrum. And I think that's a more healthy way to look at it. So the brain, TV set, 
<clears throat> so if you apply this analogy, analogy, it may be helpful. In the, often in spiritual literature, the mind has been depicted as a mirror. We see this in the voice of the silence, where the description is made about the mind, describing it as a mirror upon which dust collects. And that in order to remove the dust, the mind needs the gentle breezes of soul wisdom to cleanse it. So this mind, if you view it as a mirror that reflects something else, in this case it reflects the spectrum of consciousness, this mirror has the capacity to be, capacity to be turned in different directions. So when it's turned downward, it reflects all of the different things of the, what we would call the lower realms. It reflects, you know, the concrete thoughts, it reflects the emotions, it reflects the physical objects. That's what is seen upon the screen of the mind. What theosophy and other valid spiritual traditions would tell you is that there is another option. And that it is, in fact, an option in the fact that it's a choice that we make to retrain ourselves so that this mirror can be turned in another direction, so that it reflects what's above. And in that process is the process of the awareness of spiritual possibilities, the awareness of a sense of an overarching sort of unity that embraces all things. So it's this process of how we regulate the mind that determines how we perceive the world, how we perceive ourselves, and how we behave. And that's something that's within our control, although it's something that takes time. So the mind is where the work must be done. So probably all of us are familiar with at least the basics of the story of the cave dwellers told in Plato's Republic. Uh, it's one of those stories that appears around the world in every spiritual tradition that you can find in different forms. But Plato's version is one that I think speaks very clearly to the Western mind and is one that is a very clear sort of example about the mind. It's about a number of things, but it's particularly about the mind. So, in dealing with this mind, we begin to recognize that there is a need to unfold its powers through a hierarchical process. As part of this process, there are people that we think of as teachers who come into our lives to aid us at each of these different levels. Perhaps let me move ahead to a description of Plato's cave. So that would, uh, whoever it is that's operating, I hate to confuse you, but I'm going to start with let us describe the mind and the unfoldment leading to wisdom in terms that Plato has provided for us. Yep. Probablement. Uh, So the way this story is told, there are, Plato tells the story of people who are deep within the earth in a cave. They are chained in the cave and they're chained in such a manner that all they can look at is the wall in front of them. They can't move their necks to see behind and they can't see anything back there. So they can't turn around and see that there is a way that leads out from this cave to a light and the open air above. Plato further elaborates this picture by saying that there, in addition to having these people sitting here chained, that behind them there is a large fire that burns. And the fire that burns casts shadows on the wall. And not only is there this fire, but Plato further says that there's a low wall between the fire 
and then the people who are chained. So the wall, the fire. And that behind this wall, there are continually a flow of people who are walking. And the people are carrying different things on their heads as they walk by. So those shadows get projected onto the wall. And the people who are chained there, this is their vision of reality. So the chained people see only the silhouette of something. And what they do is what we do. They see the silhouette, and then they start to give it a name. And what occurs to them, also during the course of this, this uh, example from Plato, the people who are carrying the things also are talking among themselves. And so as they talk, the sound becomes reflected off the wall. And so the people are seeing silhouettes that seem to be speaking and making sounds. So it's all very real to them. So what occurs is that among the chained people looking at the shadows, there are the ones who each one would say, if they looked among the group that was there, they would say, this one here is clearly the wisest of us all. And that one is wise because he can predict which shadow is going to come next. So the one that's able to name the shadow before it appears becomes the sage among these chained people who have never seen the light. I often compare this to, in our world, economists fulfill this sort of function. Uh, the shadowy world, they tell you what's happening. If they're right, we glorify them. If they're not, well, they're yesterday's news. So anyway, this is the scenario that uh, Plato describes. So Plato then asks the question. He says, let us suppose that someone from outside of this group comes and grabs one of these people who has been chained for their entire life and leads them away. And the first place he leads them to is near the fire. And so he asks the question, what would be the reaction of this person upon living a life looking at shadows now placed in front of a fire? And so obviously the fire would be too bright. It would hurt his eyes. He wouldn't have been able to adjust to this sort of light. But then you ask the question to this person, which would he think was more real at that point? The shadows or this new thing that he's been ex exposed to, this fire? And at that point, out of habit, his mind would still be grasping at the shadows. The whole meaning and influence of this light thing would not have made itself known yet. So Plato then says, OK, let's take it a step further. Suppose now this man is led out from the cave up to the clear air above. And now for the very first time, he's exposed to the light of the sun. What then? Obviously, just coming out of the cave, this brilliant light would be much too much to bear. It would be impossible to look on things that are so bright. He would be blinded by the light. But gradually, the same person would develop the ability, first by looking, perhaps, looking around him, he would be able to see things. And then he would actually be able to consider the source of this light. Not by turning his eyes directly toward the sun, because they wouldn't have strengthened yet, but looking in puddles of water. He'd be able to look and see this bright light reflected. And by a process of reason, would come to the conclusion that all of these things that I see are illuminated by this orb that we call now the sun. And gradually, he would get to the point where he would actually be able to look upon the sun with his naked eyes. So this is the way Plato describes it. And then, of course, Plato being Plato, or Socrates being Socrates, I guess, he takes it one more step. And he says, now let us suppose that this same man 
who has become accustomed to this life in this lighted world is now led back down into the cave and brought back to his fellow people, chained, looking at the shadows. What would be the effect then? Clearly, at that point, he would become blinded once again because his eyes had not accustomed to the darkness. And the response of his fellows who had been chained there, they would look at this man and say, what's happened to him? When he left here, he was a normal, sane person. Now he comes back and he's talking about something about light, says there's a ball in the sky that's shining fire down on the earth. He's gone crazy. He's mad. And they would make a pledge among themselves that never will we allow someone to come and mistreat another one of our members as he has been mistreated. If anyone comes down here to try and take one of us away to this supposed light, we'll take matters into our own hands. This is the story. And obviously it's a story that's not about someone in a cave underneath Athens. It's a story about us. And it's a story about the possibility for our minds becoming illumined. In the theosophical terminology, the word that is used is for the illumined mind is manasa taijasi. And it's one of those Sanskrit words which says illumined mind. Manas, in which the buddhi, the light of the intuition, the buddhi shines upon it. The cleaned mirror pointed upward is this experience that Plato describes. Uh, he further describes a choice that is made by those who have not only the good fortune, but who have done the necessary work to expose themselves to this light. And that choice that is made is an unpleasant one often, but is one that seems to be taken with joy. That no one has to drag you back down into the cave. But those beings who have this exposure go willingly and work willingly among us, the shadow dwellers. So for each of us, this is the story. This is what happens. And I think for each one of us, we have a very special opportunity. Uh, it's an opportunity that recurs in every single moment. None of us is in a position where we need the next piece of new information. Essentially, we all know what we need to know at this point. The problem is in its expression. What we're faced with is not adding a new piece to the puzzle. What our issue is at the moment is only one of remembering that the puzzle is not in fact incomplete. That each one of us, although seemingly we're looking out, trying to find our place in the world, trying to find our position of service, trying to find that way in which we will be illumined, the great ones who have been here among us seem to leave us just one message, and that is the way St. Francis said it, what you are looking for is what is looking. What we are looking for is the very thing that is looking out at the world. So the process of being able somehow to turn within, to remember, not to create something new, to remember is the process of what we call the spiritual life.
So I would encourage each of you, just as I find myself encouraging myself every single day, to commit yourself fully to this process. It's one, it is one that has its difficulties and challenges, but is, is certainly one whose even minimal rewards outweigh any of the various challenges that we feel we have faced. So I do want to apologize if I went too far off the text. I hope you've been able to follow me in general. But if you haven't been able to follow the words, I think you've been able to follow this. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.